afternoon, all my Rural Xers out there. This is Eric, the Rural Xer, here with you, finally back for another adventure. Today, this morning, Saturday, March 2nd, we are up in Clinton, Tennessee, just outside the Museum of the Appalachia, and we are going to be taking a tour through this museum. Uh, for all of those of you who are so interested in that Fox Fire, or Firefox, whichever one it is, I can't ever remember that, museum that we did in Georgia, in the Northeast Georgia area. This is very similar to it, but just even a bigger, uh, larger scale of it. So we're fixing to get out and take a tour of this place, and we're going to bring you along with us. So join us, if you will. Well, we just paid our entrance fee into the museum, and as you can see, we are in the gift shop here, and figured I'd give you a little tour of the gift shop before we head out on the actual trail around this place and it is huge but anyway uh, give you a little tour of this uh, gift shop here as you can see they sell all kinds of it looks like grains ground corn and stuff for making like white grits yellow grits all kinds of stuff here molasses cookie mix a lot of this is stuff that you would probably see possibly in an old mill store from years ago and then you've got all kinds of other little looks like um oh oh hot sauce and it looks like moonshine hot sauce very interesting. Never seen any uh, hot sauce made out of moonshine. If that's what it is, I don't know. Take a look at one of these here. We're looking at uh, Fair Hot Favorites. Fair Hot Favorites. Moonshine Extra Hot Hot Sauce. Yeah, it looks like a liquid. Not in the typical. Uh, tomato based hot sauce that you would normally see, but over here you've got uh, uh, black backwoods bourbon rub, so you got all kinds of uh, marinades and different things. Captain Rodney's original bouquin glaze, glaze, I guess, for barbecue, chicken, steaks, whatever, pork. Got even more up here. Yeah, you've got quite a bit of different things over here. Shrimp and grits. Ooh, shrimp and grits. Wow. So you got all kinds of stuff here. I pan around here and give you the whole. This is just one corner of it. I haven't looked at the other parts of this gift shop yet. And back over here, you've got all kinds of um, cards, gift cards, stationery, books over here, magazines, little corner over here, and more books right here. I'm just giving you a real quick glance at the whole thing. And a cat. That cat was perched up on the uh, register when we came in. Pretty. Just sitting up there. And first, it was sitting so still, I thought it was a, a little stuffed animal of a cat. But then it started moving. I realized it was a real cat. <laughs> and it was just perched up there. And I started petting it. Pretty cat. Calico. Uh, not calico. Uh, tabby. Tabby cat, I guess is what you'd call it. But anyway, uh, getting back to this, you've got all kinds of... Uh, shirts over here different items looks like maybe even some handmade items over here in this little shelf possibly maybe some locals have made but you got all kinds of um, uh, I don't know if this is coffee or if this is um, 
just little oh and maybe candles that may be what this is Let's see what this says right here cotton blossom warm floral breeze swirl through fresh notes of cotton i'm taking it this is probably candles scented candles it may be homemade scented candles and little um, crock pots or something very unique but anyway you've got quite a bit of um, stuff here very interesting you've got some shirts over here and hats mugs and some other things over here looks like some pottery Maybe even some handmade pottery. I don't know. Back here in this little corner. This is very interesting. Look at this piano, this old piano. They're using as using it as a display. But this is uh, an old piano that you might find in someone's house from years ago, back in the, oh, maybe early 20th century, 1900s in that era. And there's another one, I think, over here as well. It's a newer, definitely a newer piano, an upright. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a newer, much newer piano. We've got some uh, his and hers pillows over here. And then you've got, I don't know what this is. Keychain, brass keychain. Hmm, okay. And this is looking from the back corner back up towards the front. You can see a, a lot more stuff. There's a lot of items in this little gift shop here, quite a bit. Very, uh, a lot of it's very unique, possibly handmade. You know, but we're going to head on out to the trail now and meet up with uh, Teresa. So we'll see you out there in a second. Well, we're out here at the first display of the trail around. This is called the... Uh, Tom Cassidy house, which is actually labeled number two, but the uh, building that we were just in with the gift shop and where you pay for your uh, entrance fee is uh, actually the number one display. But anyway, this is the little building right here. Very small, only one room. I don't know what kind of a building this is, but as you can tell, I'll get a little shot of that and y'all can read it. You can pause the video anytime you want to and uh, read that. I just got through reading this placard that's just outside the door here, and it's very interesting. This uh, man lived, this one man lived in this cabin from 1920 to 1989 and died here. And this is exactly how he left it whenever he passed away. And some of the things... Uh, that was very interesting about it is the fact of right up there, if you can see, I'll zoom in on them, the tin roof is riddled with bullet holes. And it says, and if you read the placard, it says in the placard that origin unknown. So don't know if someone had shot in it or shot out of it, but there was bullet holes all in that tin roof, as you can see, mostly right above the bed. So. I kind of wonder if it wasn't him shooting it. <laughs> he had a pistol in here, as it said in the placard. So anyway, very interesting. But, uh, and, and of course, this, one, this little uh, sign right here says, imagine standing on the porch of old Cassidy's little home, listening to him play the fiddle made, of his, made by his grandfather, Fate Cassidy. And then uh, right there is a calendar. Must have been the last calendar that while he was still here, because it says July 1989. Very interesting. So this man lived in this, in this cabin. So it wasn't just from way back in the um, late 19th century or into the early 20th century. He actually lived in this cabin out in the woods as a bachelor from 1920 to 1989. Very interesting. We're now at the Display number three, or attraction number three, whichever one you want to call it. And this is the, called the Gwen Sharp Playhouse. And here's the playhouse here. I'll back out, give you a better view of it. There you go. 
And this has got a little bit of an interesting story. The man who had this built, he didn't build it himself, but hired a neighbor to actually build it for him, for his um, five-year-old girl, daughter, his only daughter, uh, Gwen Sharp. And um, it was actually located in an area of Tennessee where they were going to flood the area with a lake. And most of the structures that were there in that area were left to be flooded, but this one was for some reason preserved and it was moved to a different location and was preserved for a number of years and stayed in the family by Gwen Sharp and the museum bought it like back in 2007, I think it was. But here's the, the front of it. Very interesting backstory on this. And uh, let me zoom in here, give you a better shot. You can stop the video anytime you want to and read that. That gives the whole backstory of it. But anyway, there's some uh, drawings that she must have done when she was very young. And there's something, another placard. I didn't see it before. You can read it. But uh, there's a little playhouse, and it said in there that Gwen was the envy of all the neighbors in the area because this was such a unique playhouse. We are now in the main museum building uh, and this is actually called the Appalachia Hall of Fame display here and um, as you can see from the sign uh, that box up there and it says pictured here are my friends the warm happy independent folk of southern Appalachia they are my people and the people I love, and it was because of them and hundreds of like them that I started the, the Museum of Appalachia, and it is to them that this Hall of Fame is dedicated, John Rice Irwin, and he must be the um, one that actually started this museum years ago. And I don't know how old this museum is, so I really would have to do some research, or I'd have to do some research on that to uh, find that out. But uh, these are all the people that he uh, met and uh, got stories from and, and got you probably museum pieces from as well. As I said before, we are in the uh, fourth point of interest of the museum, which is the building here, which houses uh, the uh, Appalachian Hall of Fame. And there are so many, so many displays and uh, cases booths of artifacts here to I want to try to get as much footage of them as I possibly can but I'm not going to do a lot of commentary on them there's a lot of information in the boxes within the boxes that tells about the display and I'll just let you read them I may com comment on some of the more interesting ones for myself but uh, from now on I'm just going to kind of film it and let y'all view it and read it if you need to
decided that even not doing commentary on these cases, on these displays in this place, is going to be very, very time consuming. So I'm just going to get a kind of an overview shot of the whole thing. Uh, maybe one day, if you're interested in these particular di displays and stuff, you'll be able to come here and actually see it for yourself. But uh, there's just so many. This is a two-story building. We've just barely scratched the surface of one story from the entrance of the building. So uh, this is just showing some of the tools the Indians made, uh, arrowheads and baskets and uh, pottery and stuff. In this case here, it's a very big case and a lot to take in right here. So I'm just going to start doing a very brief overview of some of these cases from here on, uh, especially the ones that to me aren't that interesting, I'm sure to others that they are, but uh, it's going to be hard to get out all these uh, displays in today. Now here's a display that uh, rather interesting. It's got a lot of uh, different little things up here, like old, looks like bifocals. That was uh, probably used way back years ago. I don't know how long. I haven't read any of the information on this or anything. But um, it was a funeral notice. Jonas as a Jackson. Okay. That, uh, that explains some stuff. This, this probably has a lot to do with another display I'm fixing to show you here, but um, yeah, you can see some of the tools and some of the uh, items that he collected, this man collected. I guess it, all of this belonged to him at one time. And of course, donated to the museum eventually, or sold to the museum. Now this is what I was going to show you. This is, get a full shot of it here, is supposedly a perpetual motion machine that was designed and built by Asa Jackson back in the 1800s to produce its own power and run forever, which I have read and learned a lot about supposedly perpetual motion machines, which uh, scientifically speaking, from what I have read and understand about them, are impossible to build. That they would run forever. And as you can see, it's not running now. You'd think that if it was run, it would run forever, that it would be running now, but uh, yeah, it's not. And uh, I'll get a close-up shot, better one. So you can read the backstory on this machine. This is rather interesting. Being a kind of a mechanic myself and uh, working on uh, machines and cogs and gears and stuff like that, this is very interesting to me. But uh, I just don't think that it would ever, it could ever run forever, <laughs> scientifically speaking by the laws of physics. And this display is Dr. Andy Osborne's Medicine House. 
from Blackwater, Virginia, which is right uh, north of the Tennessee border uh, with Virginia. And uh, I'm not going to go into in depth on this uh, particular display because there's a lot of information. I'll get a close up here of this this uh, placard, and you can read it for yourself. You can stop and read it if you want to. It's very interesting. I would highly recommend uh, reading all that information. But anyway, this is his medicine house. He was supposedly a doctor in Virginia and went great distances to treat his patients. Most of them he wouldn't charge anything for his services. Those who could would pay him, but here's a picture of him. But I, I'm not going to go into much detail about it. You can read a lot of the information here, but it is it is very interesting. Here is an interesting piece in this museum. For anybody who's into guns, this is a German Maxim M1908-15 light machine gun. Now how in the world did a German machine gun end up in the Museum of Appalachia? Well, here's the story. Here's a display aptly named Children of Appalachia. So these are all toys, obviously, that were probably handmade by their parents or friends of their parents. Just people in the Appalachians. Quite a few toys and dolls. And even a dress. And here is a display, sort of in the center of this whole lower floor section down here, that is dedicated to Roy Acuff, the king of country music, 1903 to And here's even more items of Roy Acuff. A 
including what looks like. Yep, Roy Aker Fiddle. Oh, it's like console radio that people might have had years ago in their home. Now, it, it was, uh, this looks like it was so nice. It was probably in a more wealthy family's home, being a big console stand up radio, it looks like. There's just so many this place has so much information stored in this place. It would take forever to really take in all this. I'm doing a short video on it. <laughs> Even if it was an hour and a half, two hours long, we'd only probably scratch the surface of all of this. But as you can see, this is a that is all about musical instruments, fiddle primarily, that um, people in the Appalachians love to play and make music with. Now here's something that's very interesting right here. I have seen one of these. I've seen them 
around here and there. Uh, churches that I've gone to, although I've never seen them actually play, because by the time usually that I saw them, they were um, past being able to play because of the uh, bags in them that were used to make the, the noise, the, the notes and all. But uh, this is pump organ. Uh, it wasn't electric, it was used um, pedals down here and you keep having to pump it back and forth as you were playing it and uh, it pumped air into bags and then the bags would pass air over uh, pipes I guess inside I don't know exactly how these work I would say it's pipes uh, inside of it make the note and um, those those bags uh, after a while would deteriorate and dry rot and they wouldn't hold air so it wouldn't be able to play and of course the keys back then on these older ones were made out of ivory from uh, actual elephant tusks and you'd actually see a lot of the keys now this one is in exception in good shape i don't know if these are actually uh, ivory or not but um, a lot of the keys that you'd see back then the ivory would be peeling off chipping off and it would be down to the wood underneath but uh, this is a very interesting piece here uh, i don't know exactly what the backstory is but uh, there's a placard that gives the information you can read it and here we've got some more instruments right here this is the dulcimer which was very well known in the Appalachians as anyone who's seen my video on the Foxfire Museum in Mountain City. The Dulcimer was very popular and it was made out of just about anything you could find and very easily play. And then you start getting into the guitars. I'm sure a lot of these have backstories. There's a very <laughs> bejeweled one right there, as you can see. My son would be very interested in this because he he loves He's learned how to play guitars and is self-taught and has had a, got a pretty extensive collection of guitars himself and he's only 20 years old and he would be extremely interested in all of these. I don't think he just likes playing guitars but I think he likes collecting them too. He plays them all though and he's a good, good guitarist does it more as a hobby though. And here's something over here in the corner, an old Victrola. And my dad actually had one of these that actually worked. <laughs> that was until someone, probably myself, overcranked it and uh, it quit working. I think he did get someone to actually fix it, but um, I think he ended up selling it. It was a stand-up Victrola that he got uh, from someone. I don't know if it came out of a house that he bought and it sold or what, but uh, anyway, he had one for a while and it sat around in the office that he had walked out of. And I remember playing it you know, quite often. It had some records that came with it and everything. And here we actually have a piano. Now this is very odd because it looks like kind of a cross between a, an upright and a baby grand piano. I thought it was some other type of instrument, but I read some information about it, above it, and it, it says it is a piano. Very nice and very, very unique. And here's the and here's some more 
instruments the apparatus main one I think this is a okay it's a dulcimer let's put this in this that's kind of that kind of hard but it's a dulcimer and of course a fiddle That's that one on the back there. I want to face this one or both of them, considering that one also. This one in the front is a little bit bigger, shaped a little bit different, but it may be a dulcimer as well. I'm not really sure. And this whole area is kind of like, it is where the Carter family. There is a five string banjo. You can tell it's very old. And this up here on the top shelf is a chalk box mandolin. Chalk box. It was made out of a chalk box. That's what it is. See, they didn't make mandolins out of anything and everything. We actually bought a couple of mandolins up there that I'm in the city. Fox Fire Museum and uh, took them home and gave one to my daughter and one to my son as souvenirs from up there, but they are playable. They're not just souvenirs to put, be put on the shelf, you can actually play them. That's a rare early dulcimer down there. It looks like it was made out of something else. This is called the fishtail dulcimer. And this is a totally home homemade five string banjo. Of course, as you can see, it's turned upside down. I'm sure it's missing the strings, but you can tell it is extremely old. And here is the Helen Carter accordion. I know I'm skipping over a lot of this very quickly. There is so much to see, we haven't even made upstairs yet. dedicated to Bill Monroe, father of bluegrass music. I'm sure anybody who has listened to bluegrass knows Bill Monroe. I've even heard of him. I'm not that big into bluegrass. I do enjoy it more so now than I used to in my early days. But there's a lot of uh, more instruments. Area. 
here is a very unique instrument. We can't find any placard or sign, card, telling about what it is at all. It is a very unique instrument, but this display is for the famous Grandpa Jones. And anybody who's ever watched, and I'm sure most people have watched, Hee Haw. <laughs> Hee Haw has heard of Grandpa Jones, and this is about him and his life. If you want to read more about his shotgun, you'll have to stop the uh, video and read the placard of it. There's a lot of information here to take you. I'm sure this, the instrument that was at the bottom of this booth display was one of his mini instruments that he had. You can see there was a lot, a lot of information about him. And here we have the world's largest basket. Or so they said. <laughs> Good picture of it right there. And according to the placard, it, it took the woman or man or both <laughs> nine months to build this thing. And anybody who has whittled knows what all this is. This is Winters of Appalachia. And all of these items that you see here in this case are all handmade or whittled from solid blocks of wood. Some of them are very intricate. This is beautiful here. This one of two mockingbirds. Here's some more over here in this little small case, too. Got some dolls up here. <laughs> to me, they look kind of menacing <laughs> in a way. Here's a display of World War I memorabilia, mostly hats from that era, war. And a placard down here. Which say, states, World War, World War I, the war to end all war, 1914 to 1918, the most bloody and most costly war in human history to the time it was fought. Of course, as we all know, then you go on to World War II, which was just as bad and just as costly in human life and money as well. Fortunately, there has not yet been another war since World War II, but you just never know. We finally made it to the upstairs portion of this indoor museum and we are now looking at some of the pottery, mason jars, canning jars, 
whatever you want to call them. It was handmade by the Appalachian people. And there's a whole booth and it just goes on and on down through here. There's a booth, a whole wall, that is dedicated to interesting, unusual, and everyday items made, mended, and saved by our colorful people of the Appalachian Mountains. Of course, it didn't say that, but I'm sure that's what they meant. Now, here's something that I appreciate. I have never used one, uh, but I have seen it one used. My dad had something similar to this. It wasn't really a transit, but it was a, like a leveling type thing. A device it was very similar to this, but this is a surveyor's transit, an antique piece. And uh, I'd love to see someone actually use one of these things. Of course, nowadays, everything is digital and it's all GPS based. But uh, as you can see, this is all differently mechanical and it used bubbles and and different things like that to level it up and shoot lines and, and all. I'd love to see how it was actually set up and used. But of course, here's an old grandfather clock. Witch's clock. There's a plaque for that. And Going back to the transit, here is the placard for it. And it looks like the box that it was probably stored in the actual device itself, not the tripod, but the transit itself. And then you've got the different sticks out here. That was used with the transit. And it looks like the person who actually the transit belonged to using it. Pictures of him using it. This is very interesting to me. And here's a kind of an everyday item, but it's very um, unique. And it's called a bathtub. <laughs> it's called a bathtub, but it's rather much, much smaller than a normal bathtub you see these days. And it came from, as the plaque here says, from the Hudson Dickinson Mansion, which was located in Circle Drive in Knoxville, on Circle Drive in Knoxville, now part of the University of Tennessee campus. And it goes, it does go on to say that, get a close up of that, these Dickinsons were reputed to have been related to the famous writer Emily Dickinson. And here we have telephones some floor mounted that would sit on the floor like a console and then wall mounted and another clock over here gold prospecting horn just a lot, a lot of everyday items that you would see in people's homes. Here's something down here that is very interesting. This battleship, Mount Moriah Methodist Church, Chandler. Oh, here we go. I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong placard. It was set up in front of the battleship. I don't know if it has something to do with it or not. This says, Battleship model 
made by Harv Donahue. This model of a German World War II battleship was made by my late friend Harv Donahue of nearby Powell, Tennessee. Harv carved it, called it, I'm sorry, Harv called it the Bismarck, which was sunk in 1941, but I think authorities say it is a model of a smaller German battleship sunk in 1939. what that placard is about. That's some more items. Tobacco press. And a barrel. Vineyard barrel. I guess for wine. And these look like bar stools over here. Okay, the, these stools came from the infamous Brushy Mountain State Prison in nearby Petros, Tennessee, if I'm saying that right. Just a lot of other items from that era. This looks like a model. Of a wood mill. Hence beans operable steam powered sawmill. So it's like a model, but I guess it was actually operable. You could actually build up a fire in the engine of it and power the sawmill itself in an old time radio that's very interesting a wheel from an old ferry boat some sort of a lock here of it there and just all kinds of different things here and this is the remarkable story of the 16th century scale model horse powered grist mill and the man who built Peter Wade Depp That was some story. He says says in parentheses he killed 17 men in one day. See number seven and eight below. Hmm. I don't know what that was about, but you can stop and read it yourself. Just incredible the amount of artifacts that they have here in this this place. Absolutely incredible. And it just keeps going on and on around through here. And there's multiple, multiple displays outside that we haven't even made it to yet. I'm very thankful and we're very fortunate to be able to see a museum such as this, of this caliber, but it is, like I said, it's more than a person can see it one day. And here's one of these displays that I kind of vaguely remember from last time of Eyeglasses, spectacles, or specs, as they were used, mended, and saved as heirlooms in Southern Appalachia. Mm. 
being older myself and knowing how I depend on my, my glasses to be able to see up close because I have farsighted mostly. I know how, how important glasses are the older you get. And here's more display of glasses here as well. And this is some sort of horse-drawn cart right here at the top of the stairs. I don't see any placards around it telling about it or anything, but I take it that it's uh, some sort of a, a wagon, probably used like a truck back in the day to haul things in, seeing that there's barrels and stuff inside of it. And here's even more displays, quilt, quilt, Granny Irwin's Christmas quilt. Let's zoom in on that. Be great about that. But here is the quilt itself. For those of you who are into quilting, And looks like some some old type of uh, tools that was made and used by the Appalachian people back in the day, including washboards, drills, handmade looks like a banjo, some sort of a tub or something. I really don't know. A lot of these tools I devices. I have no idea what they are or what they're used for and I have to read read about them. And you've got more instruments here. Probably Aka is a fiddle or violin, whatever you want to call it. From the Appalachians I'm sure it was called a fiddle. And of course you going down through here you've got more uh, instruments of the Appalachians and some sort of a horn there at the top. That's a mandolin, uh, not a mandolin. Uh, scrub room? No, that's, <laughs> sorry. It's not what I, I guess that's a mandolin there in the middle. Of course, a banjo right there. Or a dulcimer. Maybe a dulcimer. That's what it is. Yeah. A dulcimer. A nice dulcimer at that. Mandolin or a dulcimer one. But there's all kinds of other things. I'll shut up and let you view these items yourself. And here's a display for Gary Allen Curtis, one of the country's youngest and most unsung heroes of the Vietnam War. And this area is uh, for the Civil War. Well, at least this case here. I 
I guess all of these artifacts and pieces came from the Civil War era, not having to do necessarily with the Civil War itself, but came from the Civil War era. Some of these pieces, of course, like these cannonballs and all, I'm sure, came from the Civil War itself. But there, like I said, there's so much to see. I'm just going to kind of get a very quick overview of all of these displays and cases. Be kind of, it's going to be hard to get everything in. American Revolution, this even goes back to the days of the American Revolution. Try to get a close up of all of these placards here. So if you want to read about any of this, you can stop it at any time and uh, read it for yourself. Now this is one of those booths, displays that I definitely remember from the first time we were here. I don't know why it stuck in my mind, but this is a very, very primitive setup of a dental, dentist office. The cabinets over here for all of your different things. The machinery over here, very rudimentary and very primitive to say the least and the dental chair which doesn't look like it would be very comfortable <laughs> the whole seat of it looks like it's about to bust out i don't know i don't know if this is for an adult or for a child because it doesn't look like it would almost fit too many adults or at least these days got more displays over here housing different things including <laughs> dentures partials and different instruments Ugh. it looks like it would be very painful to be to have to go to one of these dentists using these kind of primitive instruments for sure and I apologize for the background noise what you're hearing is the the heat running in the background and there's a vent right up here above me so that's why you hear that noise Here is a buggy. Horse drawn buggy. And it is called Uncle Doctor IRA Carter and his buggy. I don't know who Uncle Doctor I oh, I'm sorry. Ira Carter. Not, <laughs> not IRA. <laughs> sorry. Add that in there, that's Ira, Doctor, Uncle Doctor Ira Carter and his buggy. Okay. But I'll get a close up shot. I can't even read that myself to see what, who he was or what he's about. 
but you can read that yourself. And now we're in a section called Death, Funerals, and Remembrances. And as you can see, these are coffins for every, everyone from adult to a child or an infant. And the different items and tools for preparing a body for burial. And the primitive tools, which are still used some today, picks, axes, and and uh, shovels to dig up a, a burial spot for the body. And of course, these are very primitive. I would say hearses, a horse-drawn hearse for the bodies of Appalachian people. Extremely primitive and caskets. And as you can see from the placard, the most simple and crudely made coffin was found floating in a corner cove of nearby Norris Lake, according to my friend Bill Henry of Oak Ridge. It is made of native chestnut lumber and was for the handles. I'm sorry. And has for the handles those from old zinc wash tubs, no fancy hardware here. No fancy hardware for sure. And here's another coffin, looks a little bit better. And this is from the back side. And as you can see, this is probably like what a funeral home would actually use because it's set up on a dolly that can be moved around in a church or a parlor or a house. A lot of times people back then would actually display the bodies in the house, the family house, and then be buried out back from there. And these were the cosmetics and different embalming fluids, I think, from, you know, Undertaker including his bag. And here's another whole wall of, of a display having to do with funerals and uh, burials and all. including a very, very strange looking, what looked like a coffin, metal coffin of some sort. And here's your more traditional horse-drawn hearse from back in the day. Well, we are now back outside, going to the fifth display of this huge museum. And that building that we were just in was so big and had so many displays and artifacts and items in there that we just barely scratched the surface, even with all of the, the ones that we did record. But we're going on to these other ones and try to get them in. Just to let you know, my battery is go starting to go down quite a bit. So we're going to have to try to hurry and get through these before the end of the tour. So let's get started. And here we are approaching the next uh, display building. It's not really the, the building itself that's historic, uh, but what's in it is uh, housing some uh, very significant stuff, including this um, thing over here for TVA, which is extremely big in the area. TVA has got a lot of uh, dams, canals, um, 
powerhouses and stuff like that that they operate in this area and, and TVA was very instrumental in the development of this area and everything. This shows the whole TVA river system that they control within the Tennessee and Georgia area, honestly, and I think it even goes over into North Carolina as well. So it is very huge and very extreme, as anybody who lives in this area knows. And uh, these are some historic pictures, uh, early construction. It looks like a dam here. Um, this is the night, nighttime scene shows much of the concrete for the dam in place. I don't know what dam this is though. Okay, um, right here it shows Norris Dam floodgates were closed on March 4th, 1936. After three years of construction, it cost $36 million to build. So this is Norris Dam, which I've never heard of, but I'm sure that it is a uh, huge dam, obviously, is made out of concrete. And here's a very historic picture of the signing of the TVA Act legislation. Uh, Senator George Norris in Nebraska, for whom the Norris Dam is named, stands over the president's left shoulder wearing a bow tie. The construction would take three years. And these are, of course, all of the workers who helped on the project, or a lot of them anyway. Here's some pictures of families, schools, and buildings in the area around where TVA has influenced the area in this in the eastern Tennessee hills. And now we're at the what's called the Arnwine or Arnwin cabin. Not really sure exactly how you say it. It's a uh, number six display, and the placard says the Arnwin cabin is listed on the National Register of Historic Places by the U.S. Department of the of the interior. It is thought to be the smallest building in the country to have received this great honor on March 16th, 1976. And here is the cabin, the front of it. It is very small. It is definitely very small. Ooh. I take it that this was probably in an area of the Tennessee Valley, eastern Tennessee area, where one of the many lakes were built by TVA and it may have gotten moved before the lake was flooded, is what my guess is. I don't know. It doesn't have a lot of history about the place. Oh, wait a minute. Here's, you can go on in here. So, ooh, you know, Teresa was right. <laughs> These floors are a little bit shaky. So we'll look at here and see what this is. The Arnwin cabin, or Arnwin cabin built between 1790 and 1820 is representative of the early pioneer dwellings in southern Appalachia. Since it was built, it was continuously inhabited until well into the 20th century. Its last inhabitants were Aunt Jane and Aunt Polly and Arnwine, or Arnwin, who died at an 
advanced age after having spent most of their lives in this small structure. In 1934, the TVA condemned the 20-acre tract upon which they lived and purchased land for $1,028.50. The cabin was built by Granger County, Tennessee, on the south bank of the Clinch River at a site called Arwen Town. Although the town never consisted of more than half a dozen cabins, when Norris Dam was built by the TVA in 1936, Arwen Town was flooded and the cabin was moved to the top of a ridge near Liberty Hill, about 60 miles northeast of the Museum of Appalachia. So there you have it. This was in an area where a um, dam was built and the lake was flooded, and this would have been flooded with it if it had not been moved. But it was moved, so there you have it. Here we have some small turbines that ran cotton gins on Cherry Creek in the Sparta Cookville area. This is kind of interesting, at least to me anyway. And a stone bell, this is a hundred year old stone bell, adorned the top of the Southern Bell telephone building in Knoxville. That's what that placard says. So this was basically just a decorative piece that sat on top of a building, probably on the front facade of it. Very interesting. And now we're at display seven, and this is about two old jail cells. These two cells dated 1874, each designed to hold four prisoners, were used in the small East Tennessee town of Madisonville. On December 20, 1917, Will Upton and his uncle Drew Upton were taken from one of these and hanged as they sang, I'm coming home. <laughs> okay, I guess they were. We hope so anyway. And here are the two jail cells right here that the placard was speaking of. Very, very rustic and rusty. It said that it was designed to hold four people, four prisoners, but I don't see how in the world they could have held four prisoners. Two bunks were right there. And as you can kind of see, they take up a good portion of that side of it. And then the there's only that much on the other side, so they'd have almost been right up against each other if they, there was two more bunks over here. But here is the other one. See if it's got, yeah, it's got two. It's got four bunks in it, but boy, I'm telling you what, there's very little space in between. That is for sure. That would have been very, very cramped. <laughs> And now we're in another display building. They call it display barn. But this is mostly tools that were used by uh, people of the Appalachians for years and years. And this building is absolutely full of tools. We were walk As we were walking in, Teresa was telling me that this is one, one of the only displays or buildings that she remembers because it was just absolutely cram packed full of tools in here. And her dad's got a major collection of tools himself down in the basement with all kinds of tools hanging from the ceiling and rafters and stuff in his basement. You got a lot of uh, what looks like old barrels, buckets, and then baskets and stuff over here in this area. And then you got a lot of grist mills that was used for grinding corn, wheat, into flour and, and all. And this was prominently used in the area at mills, and usually mills were always built on um, creeks and rivers, so they could use the power of the water to turn the, the wheels and create motion to turn the, the stones. And here is the uses of stones. Now, some of that is, as you can see, is faded out quite, 
quite a bit from age. Looks like they need, about need to uh, redo that one, that little placard sign, whatever you want to call it up there. But there's all kinds of tools and stuff, information about this. And I'm not really sure what this is. Marble Mill. There's a sign up here above it that says Marble Mill, but I don't know that that's what that is. I'm not really sure what this little contraption is. There we go. I don't know if maybe this might be cotton gin. I really don't know. It'd be interesting to know what it what it was. But you got a lot, a lot of very primitive tools in this building here. And here you've got a very, very primitive spinning wheel. And this is the only way that they were able to take um, cotton and spin it into fabric to be able to make clothes out of it. So and it took them probably days, if not weeks, to be able to do that and make any kind of clothes or anything. And behind it, you'll see some of the uh, fabrics, examples of some of the fabrics that they made. And over there is a, uh, a warp, they call it a warp chain, that black thing that looks like a rope behind this, a spinning wheel. And then more of the examples of of the fabric that they would make, but there's some of the cotton in those baskets over there. And here's a wheel of weasel. And then in later years, this is what they would use to, um, and of course you saw, if anybody saw my other video, um, I'll actually link it in the description below um, so you can watch it as well. It shows uh, women using one of these looms. This is what's called a loom. Um, to make fabric from cotton strands. And it's very interesting to watch, but this is this came in later years and revolutionized um, cloth making and more of the different devices that were used in clothes making, I'm just going to go down through here very briefly and let you take a look at this. It's very hard to get all of this in. And then here is some more Oh, this is like a gunsmith's shop where they actually made rifle, rifling machine for cutting spiral grooves or rifles inside barrel. Now, I don't know if that's for, <laughs> if it's for rifles or, well, I guess it is rifles, which, how they did it, I don't know. <laughs> I've never seen or heard of it done, but that would be very interesting to watch and learn, definitely. But yes, this is uh, machinery, and it's very primitive machinery used in like a gunsmith's shop who actually made guns, you know, from, hand, from scratch. And as you can tell, these are anvils Prominently used in the <clears throat> Roadrunner cartoons. <laughs> no, these I'm sure were used in blacksmith shops for hammering out tools and stuff, very primitive tools. 
pliers and cutters and all kinds of other things, tools over the years. From the very early days of Appalachia and on into the later days. And these are more rifles here. And then you've got more weapons of some sort over here, it looks like. And these are early handcuffs right there. That's rather interesting. It looks like keys from the now famous Old Rice Grist Mill, built in the late 1700s by my ancestor James Rice. They were acquired from my cousin Sally Rice, Northern. Hmm. Okay. The irons, clothes, clothes irons, not the type that goes around your feet or ankles. <laughs> Bullets, very primitive uh, bullets. Iron knuckles. Combination knife and fork. That's wild. And as you can see right there, that's that combination knife and fork right there. Huh. Something I have never seen or heard of before. And here is an early post office. Looks like. And then you go on over here, and these are like items from an, an old general store set of scales for weighing um, produce or candy. I remember they used to weigh candy. You could buy paint candy by the, by the weight or by the pound years ago in like old general stores or five and dime stores and all. Just all kinds of things. Yeah, here's, here's some stuff right here, rice. It looks like um, possibly nuts of some sort. Um, coffee beans. Yeah, I guess this is what you would buy back in those days by the pound. Corn, maybe popcorn, I'm not really sure. There's some other things down there too, but there's all kinds of bins along through here that you would weigh the stuff out in on those scales back there. All kinds of stuff. Maybe a lot of this stuff might bring back nostalgic memories for people as old as me or even older might, might remember a lot of this. Looks like a big set of scales for something. Probably weighing out big bags of maybe cornmeal or or flour, possibly, seeing how big the bags need or how much you need to put in the bags. And here's an old, old, looks like a um, brass cash register, St. Louis. Let me see the numbers right there in the display down in there. As they rung it up, those numbers would pop up and tell you how much you had to pay. All kinds of tonics and liquids and stuff in there. Just, it just goes on. This looks like an old coffee ground grinder right there. I'm gonna take those flywheels, throw coffee in there and turn those flywheels by hand and uh, run out the coffee and put the bag underneath right down there on that little, on that little thing right there.
But yeah, this is this is all like a display from a general store. It even has some tobacco back over there. Cans of tobacco. I remember seeing those type of cans way back years ago, back in the 70s, of that tobacco. I think it was called Prince Edward. Yes, Prince Edward in a can. <laughs> and the ongoing joke was, do you have Prince Edward in a can? Yes, we do. Well, let them out. <laughs> well, for all you fishermen out, out there, here's some primitive um, fishing gear that they used to use to catch fish back in the day. And it looks like there's traps in there as well for trapping um, small animals and stuff too. Foxes, uh, raccoons, stuff. But there's fish gigs. Kinds of fishing gear, and then you know, like a net up there too. A long net that thing goes way down through there as well. Way down through there. You got your larger traps here: fox, wildcat, possum traps, probably bear trap. And that one right there, more of a bear trap. And that one there as well. Yes, back then they would catch wild animals and for the fur and for the meat. So that was a big thing back in the 1700s, 1800s. Uh, here you get into the meat, horse and mule bits. For those of you into equestrian, I said and I'll say it again I'm just making a very quick pass through of all this area and this has to do with corn I guess corn America's most important crop I guess this was the very early and primitive tools of harvesting or planting and harvesting corn crops. The different types of hoes that were used way back in the day. And now we get into the saws and other types of, uh, well, knives actually, not saws, but knives it looks like. All kinds of um, tools from like a tripod of some sort over here. Uh, surveyor's tripod made by old Bill Park, Parque and Rebel Holloway in Hancock County, Tennessee. And stakes, metal stakes that you pound into the ground. A slate with holder calculator some sort of a calculator I don't know <laughs> all kinds of things a telescope I do know that was a telescope and plumb bobs for pointing straight down and that looks to me like some sort of a lathe a handmade lathe or something 
right there. Away from the Not sure what that other machine is there. All kinds of different machines. So if I get any of these wrong, I apologize. You can you can correct me in the comments below. Now we're under the cowbells. All kinds of cowbells and sheep bells. Sounds of Appalachia. <laughs> These are power saws, but that one must have been from way back years later from the primitive tools and stuff. And you've got hammers over here in this corner, all kinds of hammers that were used for different things, jobs, industries in the Appalachians. And you go on down here to drills. hand drills from drilling into wood to drilling into the ground it looks like <laughs> I think this dude here has had one too many to drink <laughs> fortunately there's no uh, horses tied up to this buggy so he ain't going nowhere anyway but <laughs> he'll just have to sleep this one off <laughs> And then down through here, you've got milk churns and butter churns and uh, milk crocks. Just all kinds of different things. It's just the amount of items and, and all that they have in this museum is mind-boggling. Mind Absolutely mind-boggling. All the different items and artifacts that they have here. I mean, I'm probably not getting half of this stuff on camera and I'm having to... Here's canes. Here's some really pretty and beautiful canes and stuff that was handmade. And, well, that's just a display shelving. I don't think there's, they've taken the things that were, that were on there off, but here's some handmade, homemade uh, chairs, rocking chairs and uh, just regular, um, what they call um, wicker chairs, I guess. I'm not really sure. <laughs> Looks like a desk over there too. So, and a whole, area here of, of look like toys and stuff for kids. Some uh, little bed and rocker, uh, wagon, little car, and then looks like you got some uh, dog iron and, and end runs. I don't know what that is, some sort of iron stuff. Not really sure. And here are some creepy Creepy dolls. Very, <laughs> very creepy. But this was all handmade, I'm sure, by the people of Appalachia and gourds and stuff. Items made out of gourds. Here's some more. Oh, look at these, these beautiful canes up here. On the wall. Wow, that is some beautiful handwork. Beautiful handwork. And it just keeps going down through there. Unbelievable. We're back to the dolls and the things over here. I just swing on around here. Here's some <laughs> more creepy figures and all from full size to half size and smaller 
and then doll houses over here. We got doll houses, very beautiful doll houses, hand painted, handmade, and all. Looks like maybe even furniture for little girls, possibly. Yep. Polka dot. Don't know that I could take that in my room being full of polka dots like that. <laughs> well, we are back out here on the trail again. We just got through lunch and um, it's after 12. I had to take my phone and actually take it to the truck and put it on the charger for a while while we ate lunch uh, to put some uh, charge back on it because it was down less than probably 15%. It was like 14 or 13 percent at one time so I didn't want to take the chance of it going completely dead while I was trying to finish up this video the rest of the day out here so I had to put it on there but uh, we're back out here we're at the next uh, village and uh, this is this is the um, uh, I'll swing it around here and let you see the here we go swing back out here there we go we're at the People's Building, which is exhibit number nine. And these are some of the things. This is about a man who dedicated his life, mo a good portion of this exhibit, the inside of it, about a man, I should say, that dedicated his life to a one-man crusade to get the word out about uh, Jesus Christ, as you can see. So this is, there's quite a few signs and these signs he actually made and, and um, erected along the roadsides of America across America in the 1960s. There's some there and then there's there's even more that we'll take a look at in a minute inside the exhibit. But I'll swing around over here and you'll see some more like concrete ones that he erected and put out along the roadsides of America as well. And now we're inside the exhibit looking at a lot of the pictures, photos, and information about that man. Around the wall here. It's like a bicycle that he must have rode around the streets on. Now here is a map of where Harrison uh, had actually went across the United States erecting these signs that he wanted to put along the road signs. And here is the routes that he's taken across the United States. Now the bottom map, it did say that on this world map, Harrison has designated the places he wanted his signs erected, but it doesn't have show anything that I could find uh, where he was going to erect the signs at. So I'm not going to worry about filming that part. Now here's an area of the House of Many Crosses. Here rests the exact replica of the fabulous Harrison Mays house built by son Clyde Mays, a scale model of what may be America's most symbolistic home. Clyde called it the House of Many Crosses. And so here's some, looks like articles out of newspapers and magazines of when he was actually building it. And here is the scale model of what it actually looks like or looked like. I don't know exactly where this is at. I haven't read into it that far to find out where it was erected at. But there you go. There's a scale model of the house with Jesus Saves painted on the top of it. Now here is a James Bunch exhibit and a placard that tells about James Bunch was born in 1916, far back in the Great Smoky Mountains on Tennessee, North Carolina border. His 
father died before he was born and his mother lost her mind when James was only two years old. He was raised mainly by his grandparents and started working in the log wood woods and at local sawmills when he was barely eight years old. He attended a one-room school for only a few months. <clears throat> he spent his life cutting and logging timber, farming as a carpenter, and working 12 to 14 hour days as a common laborer. But when, he, when his beloved wife Harriet became bedridden and totally helpless, he refused to allow her to go to a nursing home. He sat by her bedside night and day for 14 years, tenderly caring for her every need. It was during this time that he started whittling with his pocket knife. Over the years, he created thousands of items of things he had observed and remembered from his life in the mountains. This collection was acquired from James shortly after Harriet passed away in 2003. So this is what this is all about. And here are some of the things that he's whittled out over the years. This is very, very unique. It even has a, a motorcycle over here. And all the different implements and vehicles along the wall up here. I'll zoom in a little bit on some of those. And and look at that. Look at that uh, train back over there. the track and everything else. The crane with the logs. That is really, really neat. Well, you've heard the song Little Brown Jug. Well, this is the Big Brown Jug. And this brings us to exhibit number 10, which is the Haygood Harness and Saddle Shop. This would be your typical horseshoe and saddle shop back in the day, where uh, I don't know what they would call themselves. I, I can't remember. There is, is a, num a name for that type of person, a craftsman anyway, that would make... Uh, horseshoes and saddles and stuff for horses that people would use back in the day. And this would be the tools that would be used in one of those typical shops and all. Let's see what this placard says right here. Let me read it. Well, I don't know exactly what this is. It just says, Open Block from the Courthouse in Manchester, Kentucky. Whatever that is. Maybe someone can <laughs> enlighten us all on what an Upping Block is. I can only imagine. I'm not really sure exactly. But we are now at exhibit number 11, which is the Mark Twain Family Cabin. So let's go take a look. And there's the outside of the cabin. Looks like your typical Appalachian style early days cabin. Got some tools hanging up on the outside of the cabin as you can see there. And here's the inside of the cabin. fireplace, some chairs over there in the corner, kind of a hutch to keep dishes in. I mean, it's not extremely rudimentary inside as far as the different things that are used inside of it, but the, um, the cabin itself is pretty rudimentary. There's a bed over in the corner. I don't know how many people this thing can sleep. Now, 
you swing on around here and you'll see like a corner for the for an infant and all and then there's some stairs right here that goes on up to the upper level so i would say that there's probably uh area for the rest of the family like the kids i'm sure they probably stayed and slept upstairs you know and here is the backstory about the cabin I'm not sure exactly what this is, but this is just outside of that Mark Twain family cabin. Um, it's either kind of some sort of a storage shed or um, a shed where they possibly kept food. I uh, seem like I remember seeing one similar to this at that other museum that we were at, and it was used for storing um, food or something. I'm not really sure. Here's a little shed just outside of the Mark Twain family cabin, and this is this could be either a corn crib or a smokehouse. I'm not sure which one. Uh, if anybody can enlighten us what this exactly is with the slats on it and wide spaces in between, let us know so we'll all know. Now, 13 is right across the way. It's some sort of a cabin, but it's in the process of being rebuild or something so I don't think we're going to be able to go into that which is fine uh, but we'll just kind of skip over that and go on to uh, 14 which is that right back there I think it's more like a chicken coop we'll go over there next okay this is number 14 and they have a bunch of stuff over here in front of it so we really can't get over to it but as you can see it's a hen house is what this is um, and that's what it calls it in the, uh, on the map that we have. So this is just a hen house. That's all it is where they'd raise chickens and uh, lay, in, lay in chickens and they would lay eggs and, uh, for hens and all. So. And here we've got the Wheelwright Shop, which is Exhibit 15. And I guess they made like millstones wagon wheels, all kinds of wheels. So they've kind of done a lot of, I take it, blacksmithing. Let me get right on in here. Well, this is on a, <laughs> on a slope here. But there's some of the things that are around on the inside here. All kinds of tools and everything for making all kinds of wheels from wagon wheels to mill millstones and this actually a lot darker in here than what it's appearing on the on the uh, video this camera does really good as far as picking up dark areas and all And out here, as you can tell, uh, this is where he did a lot of his blacksmithing. Um, build up a fire with coal there and heat up the metal and beat it out over here and probably on this stone, you know. And there's a lot of his tools that he would use for doing that. Here we are at Bunch Smokehouse, which is uh, Exhibit 16, and there's the smokehouse. So they'd have troughs in here for something. 
But there's the inside of the smokehouse. And here is Exhibit 17, which is the general bunch house. I don't know, meaning that it was just g the general house or the, the guy was a general, meaning general bunch. <laughs> There's the house inside of it. Right, there's the living, uh, sleeping quarters. And right in here is like, it looks like the kitchen area where they prepared the meals. And then back over here is the, what looks like the uh, living quarters where they had the fire and would sit, sit around the fire and stuff. Looks like they had some canning things over here as well. Sorry about the light. It's getting a little dark in here. Camera's trying to adjust for it. Keeps getting dark and then going to light. But there's a general look at it. Now here's a exhibit 18 which is the old sharp corn mill. And as you can see, this is not made to be or was built on the side of a creek or a river. More, it was uh, powered either probably by a steam engine and had a big leather drive belt that went from the engine to this flywheel here, I'm sure. I'm sure that's what it is. That, or it could be that they uh, it was horse-powered and they run it out to a thing that went around I don't know um, I'm assuming that it was probably steam uh, powered in the early days and maybe gas powered later on as the gas powered engine came about and they would uh, have a belt probably a leather belt that went from that big flywheel right here over to a engine of some sort and it would drive that and but as you can see there's a lot of stones millstones out here. They probably swapped them out somehow. <laughs> it seemed to me like it'd be awful hard to swap out stones. Maybe these are just here for display, but there's quite a few of them around here. And then what I found was kind of odd was this big, huge, honking piece of wood that looks like came out of a, almost like a redwood out in the redwood forest, but I'm sure those were probably even bigger out there than this. But this is probably from one of the early early growth trees in the region and was probably sawed down and a big slice uh, cut out and brought here for some reason for display which is like i like i said before kind of odd being that it's with the corn mill or a yeah corn mill rather than a sawmill someplace but whatever <laughs> and here we have the McClung house which is exhibit 19 now this is this was probably a later type <laughs> model so to speak of a cabin and I think the reason that you see two different sections of it and we'll find out for sure in a moment but one of these is probably the kitchen which was built separate from the living quarters that way it would keep the heat of the kitchen when they were cooking away from the the rest of the cabin and that uh, area between would allow a breeze to blow in and keep the living quarters actually cooler in the summertime when it was really hot and all but we'll find out here in just a minute well i was partly right this is the kitchen area as you can see there is a fireplace over there and they probably used it a lot for cooking but then there was also a stove over in this area right here, um, iron pot belly type stove. Well, not really a pot belly, it was just a regular iron stove. But anyway, they done cooking and heating on it as well. But as you can also see over here at the corner, there's a bed. So it could have been that they used both sides of this, like Teresa, me and Teresa were discussing, maybe they used this during the winter time because there was more heat in here from cooking and everything. Or maybe it was just the fact that they had such a big family they had to use both parts of it. But then, of course, in the summertime, it would keep it cooler um, with that 
uh, breeze blowing down that uh, tunnel between the two houses and all. And of course you have your uh, dining area over here. But uh, I thought this was very unique. Uh, there was one of one very similar to this over at that other museum that we went to, that Foxfire Museum that we went to, and it was like that. And they said the reason they built it was to keep the living quarters cooler in the summertime and the kitchen would be in one part and most of the living quarters would be in the other part. And now here we are in the other side of it, which is, if you're looking at it from the outside where we were at before, would be the left side. And this is the living quarters over here more so, obviously. There is a loom and a dresser and some other things uh, in this, this cabin, this part of the cabin, and a bed over here. But kind of a small bed, more about the size of a may say it maybe a uh, regular size bed nowadays. But you also have a loom over here and a sitting area over here with a looks like a phonograph, an old um, drum style phonograph that wasn't used or made for very long at all. Then out here in this area between the two parts of the cabin you've got a, a little horse-drawn buggy I don't know if maybe they used it with uh, miniature horses I don't know very small I don't think a very big horse would <laughs> it take a very big horse to care, pull this thing it looks like a trunk over here on this side and just some odds and ends here maybe another trunk or storage box here some more tools up here on the side. It almost looks like a level. It is a level, but I don't know. Never heard of them using a level back in those days. But there it is. There is a, a level. That's very odd. Very interesting. That brings us to exhibit number 20 <laughs> of about 36 or 37, if I'm not badly mistaken. It's a lot of different cabins and structures on the property around here, but this is the Mark Monroe Pioneer Log Cabin. And here's a placard for it that gives a little history of it and what it was used for. And as you can see, there's there's quite a bit of stuff in it, but you really can't go in it because the door is so small. This is the only opening, the only way to get into it, and it is very small. There is a table in there. But uh, I guess it was mostly used as a kitchen and smokehouse, and all, so there wasn't... very much room for living quarters by no means. And here we are at the Exhibit 21 Broom and Rope House. And we'll just take a quick look in here. Quick gander. It's just another cabin. Basically, oh, I'm getting old. <laughs> broom winder. That's what this machine is, is a broom winder. You can see there's all kinds of other big utensils, big pieces of equipment that are what were used for making brooms around in here. Got a loft up here, area for uh, the stuff that you made brooms out of, straw. I guess that's where they held it at up there. And more pieces of equipment that actually made help make the the brooms and all. A little table over work table over here, and then sticks for actually the the broom handles and all. Cox corn crib, another corn crib. Of course, you've got this horse-drawn buggy said Doc Randall's Medicine Show. Pills Tonic Music. Yep. Typical 
medicine man. <laughs> and what this says is Doc Randall's mystery cure, good for men or beast, wildlife, flowers. I guess it's good for everything. I'm not sure how true that is, but <laughs> I wouldn't try it, I don't think. But we've got more utensils and tools and stuff hung up along the corn crib. Here's Dan L. Boone, Daniel Boone cabin. And this is quite an old cabin, as you can tell from the moss growing on the roof of it and all. But there's, there's the front of it. Very, very uh, rudimentary, very primitive cabin by all measures. Now this is definitely a primitive cabin because it even has a dirt floor. It didn't even have a, a wood floor in it that got you up off of the ground. This ain't the, the dirt is actually the floor <laughs> with a very primitive bench and table here to eat at. Some tables and stuff over there, benches, and then a, a very primitive bed over here. Nothing that I would definitely want to sleep in these days. Uh -uh. <laughs> but this is extremely primitive. We got goats. We got goats and kitties. Look at this little kitten coming up. Oh, hey there. Hey there. Look at this. <laughs> me. 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 Look at these goats. They're all coming over here to me. Like I've got something to feed them. I don't. <laughs> this is probably some of the animals that they would have back in the day. Let's see if I can get them all in here. <laughs> Here's Irwin's Chapel Log Church, which is Exhibit 25. It's another very primitive building with what, what looks like wood shingles with a lot of moss growing over top of it and a pipe for a wood stove coming out the side of it. Looks like maybe a door at one time. <laughs> we got a kitten going up the tree there. Look at that. And here's the inside of this Irwin church. And there is a true potbelly stove over there. And it's very primitive, but not as primitive that, as that last cabin we were in. It's actually got a wood floor at least in it. But very primitive benches in here. But that's what people were used to back then. And we got Big Tater Valley Schoolhouse 26, which is this right here. And another very primitive, very, very primitive, very early days schoolhouse, one room schoolhouse. It's even got the girls and the boys outhouses out here. <laughs> Take a quick look inside here. They didn't even have desks in here. They just had benches for the kids to sit on. And a pot belly stove and a little podium for the teacher to stand at. There was one desk right here at least. At least they have one now. Some chairs in the corner 
and that's the inside of the of the schoolhouse. Coming up on a peacock who's fanning his feathers out. I guess trying to shred his stuff. Well, we're getting to the end of our tour here. Um, we've only got a few more buildings. May not even, I may not even film a lot of these buildings here. They're basically just cabins we've seen before and all. I've got, I'm sure, plenty of footage uh, for this video. Probably be a pretty long video. I'd say, I'm guessing probably around an hour, hour and a half at least. So anyway, we'll continue on as long as we can. 28 is Loom House. Yep, here's a very primitive loom, honestly. I guess these people actually had a separate loom house that they could come and do their weaving at. They have cotton up here, probably had bales of cotton up here in the overhead in the attic area. And uh, done all the weaving down here. Got some pieces of equipment over here too. Not really sure what they are unless it has something to do with uh, uh, cleaning up the cotton or something. Racks that they use for cleaning the cotton, possibly. And here we have the Peters Homestead House. Now this is a pretty big... <laughs> and there's Teresa up there waving at the camera. Say, hey, Teresa. Hey, Teresa. <laughs> yeah, she, she was already sitting up there. She says, I ain't moving. She says, I'm going to sit here. I was like, that's fine with me. Whatever. <laughs> anyway, so this is the Peters homestead house and as you can see it's uh, quite a bit bigger than some of these very primitive very uh, rudimentary um, cabins that we've seen before so let's go on up here and take a look at it it's got actually two levels two complete levels hey Teresa <laughs> I think she's tired okay I am too <laughs> I'm about wore out, <laughs> but uh, here's what looks like a bedroom, maybe the master bedroom because there's only one bed in here and it looks like a, a grown-up's clothes, coveralls hanging over there in the corner, and you got a back door, a door going up to the upstairs, and you got a big fireplace over here, nice fireplace, a little sitting area here. Now, let's see. We can't go up those stairs because they've gotten them blocked off. Don't want to go anywhere we're not supposed to. But anyway, here's a very uh, one, one bedroom of this cabin. Let's take a look and see if we can go. There is a set of stairs on the outside going up the middle. Let's see if we can go up there. Now, here is one side. It'd be the right-hand side looking at it from the front. Uh, and it looks like a bedroom probably for a couple of kids. It looks like maybe two or three kids, possibly four, because those beds are pretty big. Uh, as you can tell, fairly big, large size beds and all. So I'd say that two kids could actually sleep in those beds, small ch uh, children. And uh, you got a spinning wheel over here in this area. So they may have used this for actually spinning um, fabric and all. But there's the bedroom. There's one side. They made this a very, very narrow opening right here. Extremely narrow opening. I had to actually turn sideways to get through here because my shoulders won't fit through. <laughs> that must have been for kids. 
I don't see how, well, back then adults may not have been as big as they are now. But uh, anyway, here's a very fairly large room. Not a whole awful lot of stuff up here. Just a few odds and ends here and there, as you can see. But, uh, yeah, and right here it looks like you've got a the chimney for the fireplace downstairs coming up through this area up here going on up to the roof. And you know, it goes right on up through there. And now we're on the left side, on the lower level, and as you can see, this is definitely the kitchen area down here. And a uh, big fireplace over here. I don't see a stove, although you do have like a uh, storage area for jars of stuff over here, canned items, canned goods, some stuff up above the, the fireplace. Looks like a pantry for dishes and stuff over there and, and your eating table. Look like a deluxe <laughs> cabin compared to some of those other very primitive rudimentary cabins that have we've uh, seen before this is really neat they've taken an old millstone and sunk it down into the uh, the ground down here for people to step on that's really neat right there oh underground dairy yeah i see it uh-huh Right there, underground dairy. I guess that's where they kept their milk in storage underground uh, to uh, keep it cool, keep it from spoiling and all. And this is a smokehouse, another smokehouse over here, or meat house. Looks like they had some sort of a big trough or something over here for something. I don't know what that was. If anybody knows what it might be used for around the smokehouse and why they always seem to have troughs, in or around the smokehouse let us know in the comments section below but here's the smokehouse I'll climb up here and there's troughs around there too one there and one there maybe that was where they had either vats of water or chemicals where they would separate the meat from the from the uh, hide so they could use the hide as clothing and all I don't know I don't know enough about making leather to know whether that's what it was used for or not now here is something that is extremely interesting for anybody who's ever watched the discovery series moonshiners will know and heard of Popcorn Sutton, or even ones who hasn't <laughs> uh, watched it. They may know him personally from years ago, having worked with him or made moonshine with him, uh, bought moonshine from him, but he was an extremely famous character that made moonshine. And this was his steel that he once used in North Carolina and typical of Appalachia. This is very rudimentary, but from what I, I've heard, his moonshine was known to be extremely, extremely good. Of course, I don't know. I never drank any. But, uh, yep, he made it out of rocks, and he made his, his uh, fires instead of out of uh, machine and and uh, metal and stuff like that he made the fireboxes out of uh, and i may be getting this completely wrong but out of rock and mud and very primitive very primitive but uh this was his moonshine setup but anyway i'll get a close-up of that for anybody who wants to read it. And here is your typical
sawmill. And this was actually run, as you can see, by, it looks like a gas engine. I'm pretty sure that's a gas engine because on, on top sits the gas tank and they would fill it up. As you can see, let me get a close up of this right here, right there on the top was the filler neck where they would pour gas in. And of course, there's the uh, uh, exhaust where the uh, exhaust would come out and coming off that flywheel, they would run the uh, probably a long leather belt over to the actual sawmill itself, which sat over there. There's the big blade, as you can see. And uh, they would cut, run boards through there and, and split, uh, split them and uh, cut them up for use in cabins and all kinds of other structures. And sometimes I may actually have this thing running. It looks like it was running at one time. It's probably not running today. But during maybe the summer months when more people are here, they may actually get out here and actually run this thing, uh, sawing up um, boards and all just to show the general public how it actually runs. But it's very interesting. Um, I have grew up in an area where there was a lot of sawmills up in the mountains and stuff. And, and people done a lot of sawmilling. I actually knew some people that I worked with that done sawmilling and all. Of course, their equipment was a whole lot more modern than these primitive sawmills here are. And here is our last display exhibit of the day, 37 Steve Park, Parkey Blacksmith Shop. So I don't know if we'll be able to get down there to it, to actually look inside of it. I think you can go down there now. I was going to say you can go down there, but it doesn't look like it's open there either. It may be completely blocked off for right now. I may have it closed for some reason. But anyway, just another cabin they used as a, a blacksmith shop. So this is our last one of the day. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> I thought that they had this blocked off where we couldn't, where we couldn't get down here and look in it. But you had to go out a little ways along the, the railing, the fence, and then come down. There was another path that you could come around and actually get down here to it. But uh, there's not a whole awful lot. Same type of tools that we've seen in some of the other blacksmith shops and stuff. Again, very rudimentary. And there's the furnace over there where they would heat up the metal and then beat it out in whatever shape they wanted and all the different implements and tools that was used in a blacksmith, a typical blacksmith shop, making metal objects. Well, that concludes our tour of the Museum of the Appalachia here in Clinton, Tennessee. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. And uh, for more similar content, consider subscribing to the channel. We know that a lot of you really enjoyed our video, watched our video on uh, the Foxfire Museum in Mountain City, Georgia, uh, that we've done mm, pretty recently. Uh, it's been a few months ago, several months ago. But anyway, we know a lot of y'all really enjoyed that, and we hope you enjoyed this one as much uh, as that one, if not more. So, like I said before, I will put a link uh, to that video down for any of you that might not have seen that one and might have fallen on this video to start with, I will put a link to it in the description below, so look for that down there. Anyway, with that, we're going to get on out of here and get on down the road. We are extremely tired. Uh, it's been well over a half a day. It's actually, it is almost three o'clock. We got here shortly after nine, so we've been here several hours, excluding probably 30, 45 minutes for lunch that we took, five or six hours that we've been here so far. <laughs> so anyway, with that being said, we're going to get on uh, out of here and down the road. We may go to possibly another attraction. We don't know, depending on how tired we are. I'm pretty tired. Uh, my dogs, as they say, are barking. And uh, I just about soon go back to the motel and, and take it easy, but we'll see what uh, Teresa wants to do. But anyway, that being said, again, we're going to get out of here. God bless, and y'all have an absolutely fantastic day.